Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Emily Club. Uh, I want to, you know, say thank y'all for coming, and you know, it really shows that y'all must like what you're doing, and might be something similar. It might just be that this is something that's akin to what y'all are doing. Uh, but it's great that y'all are passionate. So, what is the Analog Club? The Analog Club is meant to organize this discipline. And you're here today to hear about some great research done by the community here at UT. Uh, we've got Dr. Hansen's group, Dr. Porter's group, uh, and uh, who else is here? All right, so we have some more people coming later, but they're later in the show, and so that's okay. So what have we done as the Analog Club? All right, so we've had a few events going on in the Analog Club. Uh, we've done things with TI, we've done things with Keysight, uh, TI brought us through all their suite for designing palatronics. They walked us through how they could design boards with PMICs, so with multiple converters in one chip. They showed us how you could take one of their parts that is just a power electronic and put that on your boards. And then they also showed us how you could make custom power electronics based around their chips as a system. And then we looked at Keysight and their suite of tools in order to build devices as well. So this is mostly known for being RF, their pathway suite, uh, but they also have a great toolbox for Powertronics as well. And then the club itself has done a few projects. Uh, along with pathways being a great way to analyze your boards, we also have uh, a presentation on what else is a print circuit board, where we looked at uh, doing heat syncing, we looked at uh, doing connectors out of PCBs, uh, just some interesting analog and RF structures that you can make out of just board and silicon. And then we've also, we have also had uh, these other projects. We've done uh, phase lock loops, which is kind of an advanced clock measurement system. Uh, we've done uh, headphone amplifiers. Uh, these are kind of more introductory. Uh, you have the amplifier, which is basically for people who've done like a 302 class, right, into a electrical engineering. If you think you can do resistors and amplifiers, then you can build an audio system. Uh, the, PLL, the phase lock loop, is kind of an advanced concept, but I think that you can get it if you've done something like electronic circuits where you know how a transistor works. And so this is something to say that, like, you know, maybe if you've taken that class, you've never even built an oscillator, and now you have control loops of oscillators based off of what we're doing in the club. And then those lectures are recorded on YouTube as well. Uh, along with the research that we're talking about today, we also have a chip competition as well. So uh, the Circuit State Society is putting on a competition. And this competition is to use the Skyworks process in order to build an open source chip. And uh, we as an organization can build teams. And uh, our president will submit those, uh, Srinivas. Now, uh, what goes into building a chip? You know, you have to do a few things. Uh, first, you've got to design something, right? What are you going to design? Right, so you've got to figure out what circuit you want to make and what functionality that circuit's going to do. So that's what we wanted to get done by our next meeting. So this is great because you can make anything, right? Think of it as a circuit, you know, anything you have in the modern world, you can probably put on a chip. And so that's great. Now, once you've decided what you want to build, uh, you've got to figure out how it's going to get done, right? What is the schematic look like for that type of circuit, you know? This is something that uh, we're going to have the teams divided into mentors and real teammates by right, doing the work. And so uh, this is something that maybe the mentor is going to be more adept at. Uh, but if you have some strong ideas, then we'd love to hear them. And then from there, uh, how are we going to make this, right? What is it going to be made out of? So the Skyward process, Skywalker process is going to give a shuttle of uh, three, 10, uh, millimeter squared areas, or six millimeter squared areas. And uh, last year, we only had 11 people submit designs on these 11, uh, these, uh, these six 10 millimeter squared areas, right? So out of that 60 millimeter squared area, we ended up with a very, very small utilization. You know, out of these 11 projects that people did, some of them were just these small, small references which fit into the corner over here in the side here. Right? And so much of that area, that chip, for instance, was wasted. And so if you have more and more people to submit, then you know, they're more likely to accept this. 
And so the last year was the first year that this competition was given. Uh, LA, again, they only accepted 11 applicants uh, and that came and they uh, tested their chips here in January. Uh, the whole cycle lasts right around a year. And so now that you know what it's gonna be made out of, all right, the chip's gonna come back to you, right? You've designed it, it's been manufactured by Skywater, and then they're gonna be nice enough to package it for you. So the unfortunate thing about making chips is that it's just a piece of glass. And so you don't put pieces of glass on your PCBs to test them or to use them in your larger circuits or systems. And so they're gonna be nice enough to put it in a piece of plastic for you. And then once you have the piece of plastic, you're gonna go measure it, right? You're gonna see if what you made actually did what you thought it did. And so that's gonna be a great experience. You're gonna go through this whole process. And while you're doing that, you're gonna be doing it as a team. And so you're gonna again have mentors, like this process might sound really scary, but again, just like our projects for the other things like the headphone amplifier and the face lock loop, we expect people to be really successful at this with just maybe something from 302 and 411, right? Uh, knowledge of resistors, uh, network theory, uh, you know, op amps, uh, L's and C's. You know, if you feel like you're okay at those, then we really will be able to up to speed. And then if you're great at other things, that's awesome too. You know, if you've taken analog IC design, if you've taken DLSI, right? Those are really strong skills as well. And if you have neighboring stuff, if you're a pilot trunks person, you're an RF person, uh, then that's great too. And uh, maybe we'll do something really fancy then. All right, with that all being said, what are we asking of y'all? So uh, there is gonna be some type of commitment, uh, but again, the skill wise, again, something like 302 or 411 is a great way to start. If you've had 438, which is the electronic circuits lab, then that is also great. Uh, so we need help graduate students. So again, uh, if you have more experience, you could fall into a mentorship role with this and help out your fellow classmates and make sure that the skill set stays around at UT. All right, and then how to get started. So here's the QR code. Uh, we have a list to sign up for it. Uh, if you think that you're interested uh, and you want to see if you want to follow up with this, that's great. Uh, just click yes when you get to the link and then we'll go from there. Uh, probably again, we'll figure out what's going to happen next week as far as uh, what team you're going to go into. We're going to brainstorm ideas uh, and by the end of next meeting, you're going to know what chip you're going to make and we'll start on proposals to get this stuff funded. Uh, that is one thing nice about this is that this open source competition is completely free to us. So if we get selected, we'll be on this initial shipment and they'll go make this on their shuttle. And this is for the circuit side itself. And then if we don't make this shuttle, then there's gonna be an additional shuttle for the same process in June for the open source Google Skywater competition as well. And traditionally they accept many, many more designs. And so if we don't get on this shuttle, then it's very likely that we'll get on the Google shuttle. Then. And so if you wanna make a chip, then this is the way to do it. All right, uh, with that being said, uh, let's head questions to the end uh, and we'll have our first presenter. Welcome, uh, Jared from Dr. Porter's group. Hey everyone, I'm Jared. We'll get this thing loaded up. Should be the only thing not in a folder. Fantastic. There you go, sir. <laughs> okay, hey everyone, I'm Jared Culpepper. Uh, I'll be presenting for um, Dr. Emily Porter's lab. Uh, we work with the, um, the, the lab is called Electromagnetic Technologies, uh, EMT for short. Um, we mostly work with medical technology. So electromagnetic technologies, um, particularly radio frequency and microwave, are, are really good for diagnostics. Um, 
and they're safe because there's no ionizing radiation. Um, and the, uh, the microwave frequency range is good because it is a balance between penetration depth and resolution, uh, which is something that you, uh, something that's important for uh, medical imaging. Um, it's still pretty cutting edge. Uh, there's, there's not much uh, actual product development um, already released for medical imaging technologies using RF or microwave, uh, but it works because there's an inherent difference in the um, dielectric properties of diseased and healthy tissue. And uh, you can measure that with uh, both, both RF and microwave. Um, typically the way that this works is we start with a simulation, um, sometimes in MATLAB, sometimes in Python, uh, sometimes in HFSS or, uh, or COMSOL. I'm not sure if you're familiar with any of these programs, but they're, they're all very powerful and um, you can, uh, th the sky's kind of the limit with them. So once we get some simulations that show promise, uh, then we develop phantoms, which are just physical models of whatever it is that we're, that we're measuring, be it a, you know, a torso or a head. Uh, and we'll show some pictures of that in a minute. And uh, once we have uh, prototypes that work, then we do a pilot study with humans. And that's when it, that's when it gets really interesting. Where's the mouse? Okay. So one of, the, one of the hardest parts of this is actually knowing the dielectric properties of tissue because that's a, it's kind of a prerequisite to make any assumptions based on, uh, on, based on those dielectric properties. And um, the, the main properties that we're interested in are the uh, permittivity and the conductivity. So um, generally speaking, the literature is kind of inconsistent with these properties. Uh, there, there have been studies and, you know, it's, this has been being studied for, for decades now, but uh, we still, there, there's still work to be done in determining what they actually are. Uh, they also vary uh, a lot between, between people because there's, there's so much heterogeneity geneity in tissue. Um, you know, if you have, if you have tissue in your body, it's not just fat or just muscle. It's, it's a, you know, a heterogeneous mix of the two. And so extracting useful values for any given tissue uh, gets kind of difficult. Um, there, there are ways to measure the, the tissue properties. Um, and, uh, here are some, here's some photos of that process using a, a radio frequency probe. So in the top left, there's a, a fat, a massive fat, and then we have, um, some muscle on the right and, uh, right beneath that there are, or there is a, a plot of the S11, which is the, uh, the reflection coefficient of microwaves traveling through the tissue and then back into the antenna. Um, and so uh, we've also done some simulation work with uh, heterogeneous mixtures. So in the top right, we have um, a fat background with a, a chunk of muscle in it. Um, and we're, we're studying how that chunk of muscle affects the, the properties of the fat. And then likewise, in the top right corner, there is uh, a background of in between fat and muscle, and then two chunks of muscle and fat. Uh, and then down at the bottom, the, you can see some of the uh, electromagnetic simulation results. So we can see that the field kind of curves around the, the two masses differently. And uh, that's kind of what we're looking for here. Um, electrical impedance tomography is what I've been working on for the past, geez, two years, uh, a little shy of two years, but um, the way that it works is you put an array of electrodes around whatever it is that you're measuring. Um, so the work that I'm focusing on is stroke detection, uh, brain stroke detection. And so the, uh, you put a ring of electrodes or like a net of electrodes on top of the head and you inject current between two of the electrodes. And then as the current travels through the head, voltages, uh, there, there are voltages on the other electrodes. And so you measure all those electrodes, uh, the voltages on those electrodes, and then you, you step through each pair and uh, doing that, you can make a tomographic image of whatever it is that you're measuring. So here in the top left, we have some examples of some of the models that I've been working with. The, uh, the outer shell is the, like the skull region. And then we have a layer of CSF, which is a cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that your brain sits in to protect it from shocks and, um, and stuff like that. And then uh, inside it are some examples of lesions. So there are, there are two types of stroke, either uh, ischemic, which is caused by a clot 
or hemorrhagic, which is caused by a rupture or, or blood. And uh, the way that you treat them is kind of diametric because if you if you give clotting medicine, uh, you know, medicine to break up clots to someone who has a bleed, then the blood just gets runnier and uh, makes the whole process worse. So um, knowing what kind of stroke it is is paramount. And the faster that you can detect that, the better results you get for the patients. So um, the goal is to come up with a, a system that can be cheap and safe and non-invasive and rapid. So um, we're about, we're, we've, we've shown some promising results and we're also applying machine learning to this. Uh, and machine learning alg algorithms help, um, help with this because there's, there's so much data and a lot of it's difficult to, to make any sense out of as, you know, just as a researcher. So uh, machine learning uh, helps to locate the, um, the patterns that are kind of tougher to see for, for people. Uh, let's, there's anything else I should say about this. Oh, sure thing. It's an AC current, yeah. It's, it's low frequency, so um, five to two kilohertz, five hertz to two kilohertz, typically. It's a good question. That's a good question also. So it's obviously not microwave. Uh, frequency, but um, I'll get into the microwave uh, element of this of the same project. This is there's overlap, so it's it's trying to solve the same goal with two different processes. So e EIT is a it's you're right, it is not a microwave um, um, it's not a microwave method, but uh, it is still electromagnetics. Um, yeah, good question, man. Uh, so, oh yeah, and I mentioned the phantoms. Here are some examples of phantoms that um, that they've built in the past. So we have a skull over there on the, on the kind of in the middle, and then uh, on the right there's a torso, and then uh, this this is an example of uh, the dielectric differences that you can measure. And then um, here is the result of some uh, machine learning classifiers comparing uh, bleed versus clot for uh, for some simulations. So to, to tack onto what you were just saying, the, the same, trying to solve the same goals with microwave imaging is, um, is possible. And uh, it's kind of a similar process. An array of antennas, microwave antennas, or sometimes a single antenna is placed on whatever it is that you're imaging. And um, based on the dielectric properties, the scattering of the wave is different. And so when you measure the uh, reflected wave or the transmitted wave from other antennas, you can extract dielectric properties and uh, locate disease tissue or uh, determine the dielectric properties of the tissue. So let's see, so we have um, on the top left, this is a breast cup for microwave imaging for tumor detection. Uh, and then a breast phantom with not only the physical properties of a breast, but the dielectric properties as well. Uh, and then directly to the right of that is a an, uh, a, a microwave image of a tumor inside of the breast. There's a small red spot uh, around the middle where the, the tumor is detected by the, the antenna array. Uh, and then we have some flexible antennas put into a bra cup. And then there's a patient, a volunteer there um, being, being imaged by, uh, by that, that same bra with the flexible antennas. And, yeah, so the the resolution is obviously not as good, um, but CT and MRI. Sure. CT and MRI are phenomenal. Uh, well, M MRI has exquisite resolution. Uh, CT has pretty good resolution, um, but this is lower resolution because it's lower frequency. But the idea here is to be non-ionizing, rapid, and, and safe. Uh, which CT and MRI are slow, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you know you can't give someone ECTs over and over again because uh, it radiates the tissue. Um, and then another application of microwave uh, microwave imaging is bladder state detection. So some people um, are not able to tell when their bladder's full, and so that is you know a difficult way of life. And so uh, we've we have a proposed method to. Uh, send microwaves into the body, and then based on whether the, the bladder is full of urine or not, the reflected wave is different. And um, so there would be some sort of alarm that, that tells the patient that, that their bladder is full. 
uh, and then on the on the bottom right, uh, it's a um, a difference in the reflection and transition coefficients between between uh, I think two different three different antennas um, on on the torso. So antenna one here is on the top left. Antenna three is directly beneath it, and then antenna seven is on the opposite side. So finally, uh, another application of um, RF here is microwave ablation. And this is a more destructive uh, application. So it's, it's not for imaging, but it's for uh, actually treating tissue. So you, you insert an antenna into the tissue and then it, using, using microwave, you turn up the, turn up the power and it, uh, it heats the tissue, thereby killing the tissue. So there's, this is actually already used for um, things like nerve damage in the spine, uh, but the, there, are, there are problems with it in that it's, it can be difficult to locate where exactly you're heating and to, to measure how, how big of an area you're eating and to measure how, uh, if, if you're actually reaching the, the temperature that you're supposed to be reaching. Um, so we're doing some work with, uh, with a mechanical engineering group who has developed a steerable drill to, uh, to aid in that and to, to aid in the, um, the maneuverability and uh, also for drilling into bone. So there's a lot of stuff going on in our lab and we have more projects that are just getting started and Emily's got a lot of ideas. So if you're looking for, um, if you're looking for some research to do in electromagnetics for medical imaging, then uh, I think it's a fantastic group. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you, Joe. Yes, sir. Uh, Sama? Yep. Very good. Glad you're here. Hope it's okay now. Oh, yeah, it's fine. There's a battery down issue, so just jump straight with it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, uh, can I just use the HDMI? You can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, nice. Um, hello, so uh, my name is Shana Bhattacharya and I'm with the Lu Group and we do most of our research uh, on soft bioelectronics. So today I'll be talking to you all about uh, the work that I, I and some of my colleagues did on wireless electronic tattoo body area networks. Um, so just to get a brief introduction of, you know, the, the basis of this is that we know that we are going to like for major industrial revolutions. So there's the mechanization, uh, you know, water power, steam power, when that came in, and there was a mass production assembly line, cars and stuff, and then there was the computer automation, robotics. That's how you, you know, produce things in large scale. And then now we have the IoT revolution for cyber physical systems. But then I think what we are forgetting is that to put the human in all of this. And so what we should amend the fourth revolution as would be cyber physical biosystems, right? As you all know, Elon Musk says that humans must merge with machines or become irrelevant in the age of AI. And I, you know, kind of agree and not agree with his views. All the stuff that he's doing with Neuralink is not going to be that for today. Um, but what I want to tell you guys is that any normal car that you use, and this is not a Tesla, this is like a normal, you know, Hyundai or Ford, has more than a thousand five hundred sensors in the car for different stuff, like you know, your fuel fuel sensing, speed sensing, temperature, blah, blah. But then on a human body, we don't really have any sensors, even though our body is generating like tons and tons of data. As you can see here, there's motion data, there is you know, EMG, which is electromyogram data, which is your muscle activation data. There's your pressure data that you apply on your feet that you can get your gait from. Um, you know, there's EEG data, respiration data, ECG data, all the vital parameters that you should monitor. And we all should monitor to get a better sense of how our body behaves and how you know we can get a more holistic approach of uh, our body health. So what we need is basically personal, continuous, distributed, multimodal sensing and data from our bodies 
that can talk about our health, our readiness, and our emotional level. Uh, so right now, what are the available, you know, kind of sensors that we can use on our body? So you have, you've all seen like the, uh, the cardiac halter, which is basically an ECG that you attach to your body and that works two to, two to three days that gives you an ECG reading. And then you all are familiar with the EC and, you know, the, the Apple watch and the Fitbit that tracks your heart rate. And the, the, you know, the newer Apple watches also have ECG, but then you have to hold it with both hands to get an ECG reading. And then, you, and then during the COVID times, this was pretty popular. This was the SpO2 monitor to monitor your blood oxygen saturation level. So if your sat drop, basically you had a higher chance of having complicated issues with COVID. But then these are rigid, bulky, and very obtrusive. And they're also short term. Like you can't really put them on you, except maybe the Apple Watch that you, some people even sleep with. You can't really put them on you and like, you know, hope to go about your daily lives. They're kind of obstructing what you do in your daily day, day to day activities. So that's why we want to develop very soft uh, bioelectronics, as we call them. They're non-invasive. They're temporary, kind of like a sticker that you put, like a band-aid that you can put. They're soft, thin, multimodal, conformal, and they we expect them to work for long durations of time. Of course, there's some complications in having them work over multiple weeks, and that has nothing to do with the electronics. I'll talk about that later. Um, so there are multiple projects that we have in our soft bioelectronics kind of uh, paradigm. One is the wireless uh, Bluetooth enabled chest uh, electronic tattoo. So here is basically a tattoo that, has, that, that can do ECG. As you can see these black, uh, black um, I guess, appendages as you may call them are basically electrodes that interface on your chest and they're able to read your electrocardiogram data ECG, basically, basically your electrical activity of your heart from your chest. And it also has SCG. So SCG is a new kind of modality that's not even used in, in, in medicine a lot. It's called, it's, it basically stands for seismic cardiogram. So basically it's minute vibrations of your chest caused by your heart pumping blood into your body. So it has some parts of uh, the cardiac rhythm, also some parts of hemodynamics, which is blood flowing from your different, uh, uh, different uh, vessels, like your aorta, your vena cava, and those kind of stuff. And it can also monitor your body temperature. And it's actually very accurate in monitoring your body temperature because it's actually on you. So it can monitor your core temperature much more effectively than a, even a thermal gun can on your, on your skin. So, um, so uh, going, going deeply into why we care about, you know, ECG is already there because you know, halters are there. Even though they're bulky, they're already there. So why do you care about SCG? We care about SCG because that gives us a pretty important timing, uh, which we call cardiac uh, systolic timings, uh, because the vibrations of your heart correspond to certain specific events. Uh, specifically, we are concerned with the AO, which is the aortic valve opening, the NC, which is the mitral valve closing, and then the AC and the MO, which is the aortic valve closing and the mitral valve opening. And with this, we can get like pretty important timing, like the, the PEP, which is the pre-ejection period, which is kind of how long it takes your heart to react to the cardiac rhythm that it's being uh, exposed to from the brain. And your LVET, which is how quickly your uh, heart can, left ventricular ejection time, how quickly your heart can pump blood into your body. These are very important factors when you're doing measurements like cardiac output, stroke volume from your heart. So these are stuff that you cannot do with only ECG. You need the, either an SCG or an ICG or a phonocardiogram to do that. And so SCG was kind of like a very easy, uh, conformal body, uh, body conformal way of doing it. So this is some of the data that you obtained with our participant that I showed you in the first slide. So this is like real world data captured, captured by our device. As you can see from the ECG, you're able to extract the heart peak, which is the highest point of your highest sharp peak of your ECG. And from the SCG, you're able to extract some important parameters like the S1 and S2. Uh, uh, events of the heart, and from there we're able to calculate PEP and other, from which we can extract other stuff like your cardiac output, your stroke volume, and other cardiac parameters and other hemodynamic parameters also. We also did another project previous to this that I didn't mention here, where we correlated the RAC, which is the R peak, uh, the R peak to the AC valve opening time to blood pressure, and we found out it matched quite well to one an FDA FDA approved uh, blood pressure monitor. And going forward, we also have a wireless neck tattoo uh, project where we use PPG sensors. PPG stands for photoplethysmogram, which basically is uh, 
LEDs that reflect light from your body and are able to capture like the absorbance from blood. So it's the same kind of technology that's used in SpO2 monitors that you use for monitoring your blood oxygen saturation. But what, you're, what we are trying to achieve here is we are trying to get like the velocity of the pulse traveling in your uh, vascular system, your blood vessels. So we actually have two detectors that can that can basically track the pulse wave traveling. And so getting the timing difference between the two detectors, which are separated by set distance, as you can see on the image there, gives us the velocity of your blood flow. And it's pretty important because a velocity of blood flow, or pulse wave velocity, as we call them, call it, is a very important parameter in uh, in correlating with your blood pressure. So you can kind of get a sense of your vascular resistance and those kind of uh, parameters from from this kind of data. Obviously, there there is um, you know complications when you try to actually deploy it on a human. For example, what we are trying to see is the the blood uh, pressure velocity in uh, the arteries because that basically has the highest pulse when the you know the heart beats it pushes blood into the arteries. But then if you put it on a neck, the vena cava, which is uh, sorry not the vena cava, the jugular vein. Is very near your carotid artery. So what happens is you get a you, you get a interference from the venous signal on your uh, arterial signal. So on the left we have basically a very good kind of arterial signal. This is an average over a few beats, uh, 27 beats. But then on the right you see a signal that's corrupted by interference from your veins. So you see there's a dip because the vein actually pumps the blood flows towards the heart. So it actually has a dip instead of a instead of a, a peak. And again, these are very small. Uh, the, the electronic size of the whole thing is very small. It's almost the size of a, a SD, micro SD card. The biggest part in the circuit is the battery, which has to power the device for quite a few hours. We also developed uh, some material, uh, you know, material uh, kind of uh, devices where we developed an ultra-sensitive pressure sensor, which can actually sense uh, the pulse pressure from different locations in our body. So there was one where it could detect the carotid arterial pulse pressure, the radial arterial pulse, which is basically what doctors uh, measure when they touch your wrist, and also the temporal arterial pulse pressure, which is very hard to detect. But then if, if, if a preload or a extra pressure is applied onto our sensor, then we're able to detect that pretty well. And so this can be used in scenarios where maybe you're, you, know, you have a VR gaming headset on your, uh, on your, on your face and, you know, that data, like the pulse data, can actually be used inside the VR game to do something, um, you know, the metaverse. So they're trying to get you into the VR world. And so, you know, getting all your body parameters into the VR world will be a pretty cool uh, scenario. So these are, this is kind of like the overview of the different, uh, you know, e tattoo projects that we have. So we, I talked about the chest patch, which basically I'm reading, and then the neck patch and the, uh, and the, uh, the, the pressure patch. The pressure patch is actually not part of the wireless heat tattoo thing. That was more of a standoff you know, material development. But then there's also like the electronics that deal with making that pressure pulse uh, mobile and attaching it to your body. So there is that. But then we also have other projects like an EEG project, uh, the arm arm tattoo, which does whole body hydration, the neck tattoo, which does your fatigue uh, from your EMG and then femoral EEG. So basically, uh, EEG from femoral artery. There's a wrist tattoo which does uh, bioimpedance and sweat, and also pulse, obviously. And the finger tattoo which does arterial oxygenation and then finger venting. And these are basically kind of some of the paradigms that we deal with. So there's the electrical uh, aspect of it, which is ECG, EEG, EMG. And then there's a mechanical aspect of it, obviously, SCG, which is like mechanical movement of your heartbeats, RR, which is respiratory, respiratory rate, which is the movement of your chest cavity with your respiration, thermal. You know, a fusion of these parameters can give you uh, higher level parameters like stress, fatigue, and it also detect COVID-19 because we do like temperature sensing, respiration sensing, and those kind of stuff. We don't deal a lot with chemical stuff that we do want to get into it, but we don't uh, we don't have any projects that deal with like chemical uh, things like glucose or cortisol, cortisol measurements and stuff. But we do a lot of optical stuff, as you saw, PPG, uh, peripheral oxygenation, and those kind of uh, pulse wave velocity and those kind of stuff. And then again, these are all fine, but then we have to validate these kind of uh, measurements that we're getting with some gold standards. So we try to use like FDA approved uh, gold standards uh, to validate our claims. So on the right, you can see a, a non-invasive cardiac output monitoring from Baxter that gives us like the cardiac output, the heart rate, the stroke volume, the ventricular ejection time, 
And this is data that we use to kind of validate our uh, our ejected, the data from our ejected that we extract with algorithms and stuff. There's also like the Omron, uh, you know, smartwatch. This is actually a smartwatch that can do blood pressure. It actually has a cuff under it. It's pretty cool. You can wear it all day. It will give you blood pressure, and you can correlate our higher level algorithms that extract blood pressure from our sensor readings uh, and correlate them with this kind of device. So. Um, what are some of the challenges that we deal with when we design these kind of embedded systems to do this kind of sensing on the human body? One is obviously synchronization when you're dealing with a huge number of multimodal data, and not just multimodal data. It can be the same mode, but maybe different sensors. For example, as I showed you in the neck tattoo project, there was two uh, sort of light detectors. They're in the same mode, but then you have to synchronize them very carefully in order to get like the time difference between the pulse passing through them. Plus, uh, power consumption is a huge issue. Obviously, we don't want to, you know, tape batteries onto the human body. We would like our batteries to be as small as possible. So the chest tattoo actually uses a point cell, but then the car, uh, the neck tattoo because it uses like LEDs consumes more power, so it uses a lipo for it for now. But we're trying to investigate more, uh, more into like energy harvesting paradigms. Maybe have like NFC patches that you can like attach your phone to and then read out the data immediately as you attach the phone to it. We're also looking at wireless power transfer uh, methods that we can use to kind of uh, power our devices. And then some of the other problems that we deal with when, when the human, the human is involved in these kind of studies is motion artifacts. You can't just tell a human being, just sit still, don't move at all. They'll move, they'll twitch, they'll look, up, look here and there, and that corrupts our data. So you have to develop algorithms or, you, uh, or other, uh, you know, other kind of sensors to kind of counteract motion artifacts and external noise. Uh, one external noise is a uh, very interesting external noise is 60 hertz noise that gets coupled onto your power lines. Uh, that's something that you have to be care very careful of when you're designing electrical systems like EEG, CG, EEG, uh, EMGs, and those kind of stuff. And then again, human subject testing. You know, uh, reviewers, when you write papers and you try to present it, they'll always be like, why didn't you test more? But then running human studies uh, of like hundreds of thousands of participants with hardware that's like, not really, you know, complete. You're you're still building it and you're testing it. It's kind of hard. So there's there, there are those challenges when you kind of do these kind of studies. Uh, one other project that we have, which is not related to the wireless uh, tattoo body network project, but which which is pretty interesting pertaining to this is uh, wireless charging of mobile devices and even our wireless charging of our e-tattoos uh, with on-device uh, transmitting transmitting coil. So basically, what what we are thinking of is you have like a coil on your hand that can wirelessly transfer power when it detects a detects a, you know a, a device that can accept the power, and we have tested. I don't know the video will play there. Try. Yeah, so we have tested it with the phone, and then when you put the phone on the body, it actually starts charging. So it can also be used on like your tattoos. So maybe you have a lot of tattoos on your body. So maybe you are like, oh, I don't know where heart is. So you place it on your hand. And the thing reads the data and it shows you the heart rate is this on your phone or on your smartwatch. So that kind of is a way to get rid of the batteries and stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, a shout out. Yeah, shout out to our sponsors. So we are sponsored uh, by NSF, obviously, Robert School of Engineering, the Army Research Lab, the ONR. They're really interested. The Army people are really interested in the performance metrics like fatigue and those kind of stuff, cardiac output, those kind of stuff that our tattoos can uh, extract. And if you're interested, obviously visit our new group website. We're always looking uh, for more PhD students in this embedded side of things that we can, uh, so to lead more projects, there are new projects coming in all the time. There's a pneumonia detection project, and then there's also a brain computer interface project. And so, yeah, welcome. Uh, we would like to welcome you if you're interested in this kind of embedded system, uh, biosensors kind of stuff. So uh, thank you. And you can, uh, I can accept any questions that you might have. Let's take questions for after. Yeah, after uh, presentations, anybody still around, please hit these guys up. Thank you so much, Narnam. That was great. Thank you. All right, next is Dr. Huang Krupp. Uh, Korean, you're muted. Hello. Hi. I might have my audio off. Try one more time. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can everybody hear him? Great. Okay. Uh, do you have? Can you hear me? 
Yeah, let me share my screen, yeah. Sounds good. I think you're good to start. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. So uh, I can have a chance to introduce our center. Uh, our center is Semiconduct Power Electronic Center. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a research associate at this center. So today I will represent our group to introduce our center about our recent re research, uh, some exciting projects. Um, So this is our professor, uh, Ax Huang. He is a chair professor at UT Austin, uh, director of this center. Uh, he is also, he was former director of NSF ERC Freedom Center at NC State. Um, he got several uh, uh, awards like uh, on the 100 in 2003 because of the ETO technology he invented. And uh, the SSE technology he invented uh, was uh, reviewed as like a one of 10 most emerging technology in 2011. Uh, he was also the recipient of the uh, IAS uh, Gerard Kliman Innovate Award and uh, uh, David Middlebrook Achievement Award. Uh, he is fellow of Triple E and a tr uh, fellow of National Academy of Inventors. So uh, how about let's uh, talk about a little bit a general concept of paratronics because sometimes paratronics like a, it's everywhere, but uh, we really uh, we really know about what is powertronics. So fundamentally, this world is full of different voltages, different power source, and different power loads. High voltage AC, medium voltage AC, low voltage AC, DC voltage like a 400 volt, 48 volt, 12 volt, 5 volt, 1.2 volt to CPU, PV energy source, wind turbine, electrical vehicle battery, lighting system, charger, or, or your computer CPU. So some system you can easily uh, access like uh, under 40 A volt or, or 20 volt, your, 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 power, your power adapter of your uh, computer, uh, your CPU behind your computer. Um, yeah, so some, some low voltage thing you can easily access, but we sometimes talk about like very high voltage. You only know them, but you cannot see them or, or even, yeah, you can, you can not have a uh, chance to access them. But Powertronics is a fundamental technology to link all of this kind of different voltages, different power source, different power loads with AC to DC, DC to DC, DC to AC or AC to AC. And also maybe sometimes with isolation, like transformer. Uh, not, we are talking about not like a, a low frequency, uh, a, a hundred year old technology transformer. We're talking about like a high frequency Powertronics transformer. So now Powertronics is uh, enabled technology to enabling the clean energy and efficient energy work, like a renewable energy power generation, PV, wind turbine, electrical vehicle, hybrid electrical vehicles, efficient power for, for uh, computing the centers, energy storage system, smart power grid. So actually now Powertronics is, is leading a, a very important research area about all the energy systems. Actually, Powertronic research cover a very wide range of uh, research topics, but uh, uh, one of the most important topics is always efficiency. Why we talk about so much about efficiency in Powertronic is because, for example, I, I list this kind of example here. So this is a very typical power system diagram for a data center. Okay, so you, you may know uh, uh, cloud computing but behind the cloud computing is a huge megawatt level power data centers. But in power data centers, you can see this is a long chain of power electronic process from high voltage AC with low frequent transformer to medium voltage AC still with low frequent transformer. Then up this one, 480 to DC, including UPS, then to 480 again with isolation, go to the rack level, from 208 volt AC to 400 volt DC, 48 volt DC, 12 volt DC, down to 1.2 volt uh, DC for CPU. Your CPU voltage only 1.2 volt. So you will see so many power stages for power processing in the power system just for data centers. So uh, in addition to the low frequency transformer, all of them are 
Powertronics. So we, we, we can give this one a an, an simple example. If we can improve 1.5 efficiency for each stage, then you will save totally 9% of total power. Okay, so this is a huge saving. We just improve 1.5% efficiency for each stage. But it is very challenging, why? Because we assume the efficiency for every stage already 97. Want to improve 1.5 percent efficiency? That means you need to save 50 percent of the total power loss. You need to reduce the 50 percent of total power loss for every stage. So this is the reason uh, so many people and so many research projects are focusing on how to optimize the efficiency of every power stage in power state electronic systems. So our center, uh, we ma majorly focus on very uh, wide range of research topics, but majorly we we focus on how to improve the power efficiency, uh, power density, of every stage, not only for data center, also for PV inverter, uh, wind turbine, or some uh, grid connected inverter and uh, electric vehicle systems. So we cover this kind of four uh, research areas uh, from down to power semiconductor devices research and also packaging to that one. And also to high density powertronics. This is the, uh, this is a very, uh, interesting topic. We 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 focus on how to, uh, you know, to optimize all kinds of technology to push the density efficiency to the limitation of every power conversion stage, and a medium voltage powertronics. That means we uh, we are handling like a 10 kV or maybe even 100 kV. The traditional power system. We want to replace the traditional power system with a very efficient, a uh, very compact powertronics, pure semiconductor. Uh, equipment to, to, to revolutionize the power grid. And also a renewable energy system, uh, like uh, electric vehicles, PV inverters. We have, usually we have more than 20 plus, we have, we have more than 20 students and uh, uh, two research scientists in our group now. So this is our lab, uh, we introduction to our lab facility. We have multiple labs, uh, majorly they are in people campus. Uh, we have a small lab in ER. Uh, usually for uh, uh, undergraduate senior design projects, some low voltage testing. Uh, most of the research activity happen in Pico campus, including the uh, the uh, clean room for device and the packaging, and also high density electronics and medium voltage electronics. So then, then after we uh, we introducing our uh, facility, we can look at a little bit few of our project examples. Uh, to look at what we are doing. Uh, the first one, this is like a device and the packaging level. Uh, we can, now this, this picture shows we are using uh, 1.2 kV zinc carbide MOSFET die. Okay, then we repackage that with integrated, very powerful driver circuits and the low parasitic circuits. And uh, we propose uh, an innovative driving structure and driving concept, then you will see the the turn off loss of the MOSFET is zero. So we have a theory how to prove that one, how to drive a, a high voltage zinc carbide MOSFET with zero loss at turn off. So this is a utility level uh, powertronic convert system, very, very huge. So this is multi-million dollar project from Department of Energy. Uh, we work with Toshiba, develop this, uh, this very powerful technology. This is one megawatt. We build that in lab. One megawatt, 4.16 kV M4 inverter, modular, multifunction, multi-port, medium voltage, utility scale, sitting carbide, PV plus storage inverter. So actually the input has two ports. One is PV, the other is storage. So this is a multi-function, uh, um, very advanced utility level, uh, partronics inverter system for utility system, yeah. So we, uh, we can achieve 98 peak efficiency for the whole system. So then we can look at some like low power system. This is a data center power factor cracked uh, uh, power, uh, PFC system. So uh, we use zero voltage switching techniques. So actually this converter, we switch the devices at megahertz level, variable frequency, in every switching cycle, the switching loss is almost zero because of the advanced uh, zero voltage switching technique. So uh, this, actually this technique, we, we build this prototype with three kilowatt system. 
the peak efficiency is more than 99% efficiency, very, uh, very dense and very uh, uh, efficient. Actually, we double the power density compared to uh, traditional thinking technology. And also we have more than 1% efficient improvement on just on this stage. Yeah. Okay, this is another example. Uh, not on, so zero voltage switching, like soft switching technique, we, we, we use this kind of uh, uh, technology to reduce the switching loss, but there is still a lot of innovation on topology level. Uh, I call this like a capacitor energy decoupled uh, power electronic converter topologies. So instead of using huge inductor, we use capacitor because we know capacitor has much higher more than 10 times, um, maybe a hundred times higher and density compared to the inductor. We use capacitor to, to replace the huge inductor to serve as an storage component in the topology. Then we can significantly reduce the total size of the power converter. Then you, you can see this, how small the inductor it is. Even we compare to the traditional two level uh, gallium nitride based PFC system, this multi-level capacitor energy based PFC topology, we do 70% of the inductor size, just on the inductor. The capacitor, because the flying capacitor is like using a um, ceramic capacitor, very, very dense, very, very small. So we use this topology to build another three kilo PFC system. The efficiency is more than 99.2. This is a record number in this, in this area. So another example is, uh, the PFC is a rectifier from AC to DC. Once you have a 400 volt DC, you still need to convert the 400 volt DC to a low voltage. So 400 volt DC to 48 volt DC is a very typical uh, conversion stage. So we propose this kind of concept. We call this modular isolated DC DC converter. Usually the modular converter um, was used in high voltage application, majorly because there is no high voltage semiconductors. They want to build a very high DC link, just to use lower voltage devices. So they propose this kind of some like modular converter design. But here we talk about modular converter design for different, total different purpose. Uh, so because if you have, you, you have a huge system, you have a single system, uh, not modular, then your thermal stress, because the loss happens on very dense area, only on multiple uh, single devices. But for modular design, actually you, you distribute all the power loss to multiple modules. That means you, you spread your heat source to very evenly to a much larger area. And also because power electronic com uh, components usually like a very, uh, very some, some are wrong, some are rectangular, you can, very diff you, it's very difficult to optimize size, but you can see how beautiful the, the, the prototype it is because we divide, we split the whole system into multiple smaller systems. So every component is much smaller. You can easily arrange them. So this is the reason we can achieve such a high density. We achieve this density uh, at more than 500 watt per cubic inch and a more than 98.7 peak efficiency. So this is a number no one can 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 uh, can reach yet. Yeah. So um, so this is several examples so I present to you for our research. Uh, thank you. So if we have any question, um, if, if we can we can talk about it now. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Right. Uh, I hope we can stay around at the end for questions. Uh, but for now, Dr. Pan, are you here? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me quickly show what I have. Can you see my slide? Uh, yes. Can everybody hear Dr. Pan? All right. Take it away. Sure. All right. Let me... Okay. I will uh, talk about uh, basically what uh, my research group, uh, uh, which uh, uh, is the uh, acronym UTDA, Design and Automation. So, uh, you know, as we know, right, so when you're talk talking about chip design, right, so there's all kinds of designs and uh, uh, most analog may not be very, very advanced uh, nanometer technology, but, uh, you know, we, my group also work a lot on digital as well. 
And then uh, when you're doing design, you do need a lot of automation. And uh, also recently, there's a lot of usage of AI, right? So, so my group works on the interface between design and automation. So which is kind of like uh, at the heart of the heart of this modern information technology. Uh, my research group uh, currently has uh, one postdoc and uh, 14 PhD students. And uh, I have graduated 35 students and uh, the five postdocs. They are in academia and industry. Uh, so yeah, we are one of the leading research groups uh, in this area. And uh, I'd like to uh, also share with you some of our recent uh, and uh, or the current research uh, topics. So a lot of uh, emphasis has been on the machine learning uh, for design, design automation. I'm part of the two National Science Foundation National AI Institutes. And uh, one is uh, located at UT Austin, uh, IFML uh, Foundation for Machine Learning. Another is TILOS for optimization. Right? And uh, we also work very closely with the industry such as NVIDIA, Google, Intel, IBM, Dell, et cetera. Uh, but today I'm mostly going to focus on the design automation for analog and mixed signal uh, circuit designs. Uh, and I know that you guys are trying to uh, tap out some chips right? and using sky water. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> Actually, uh, we uh, have developed some nice tools which probably can help you to improve your design productivity. Um, so this is actually uh, funded by DARPA and uh, also some companies. And uh, we also work quite a bit on other topics such as optical computing, FPGA, and uh, AI accelerators with emerging technologies and uh, uh, hardware security, right? So anyway, so the main thing of my research group, you can think about, you know, we use a lot of AI to design IC, but meanwhile, we also develop uh, IC accelerators for AI. Right? So we're trying to close the, uh, this loop. So uh, one thing I like to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, emphasize, uh, talk about today is design automation for analog mixed signal circuits, right? which I think uh, since this is an analog working uh, group, so as we know, right, analog design, right? So it's very important the interface to outside world, right? But in terms of the design, they are still mostly done manually. Uh, of course, um, you know, manually, you know, the designers, you know, while you guys are students, you, you want to learn all this, you know, uh, transistor topology and sizing and layout, you know, you get, you do simulation and then you know, oh, okay, this is design is better than the others and so on and so forth, right? So this is a great learning experience. But you know, if you keep on doing it, you may feel, oh, man, this is so tedious and also error prone, right? So uh, that's why uh, you know, actually, a few years ago, uh, uh, DARPA actually had a, a, a core to have, you know, uh, we had a DARPA project on uh, developing a magical, which stands for machine generated analog layout, right? To have a fully automated analog layout systems and uh, leverage both human and machine intelligence. It's not like oh, we are going to totally replace designers, right? but we are going to give you a tool so that you can you know, enhance your design productivity significantly. So um, what is Magical is doing like, uh, okay, so you will give me a net list and maybe with the PDK, for example, Skywater or uh, TSMC, right? With uh, all the design rules. So Magical will help you to generate the device and meanwhile, uh, you know, it will uh, generate uh, layout constraints automatically. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the details, but we have, you know, <clears throat> machine learning techniques. We also have some small signal analysis techniques and so on and so forth. So, um, well, okay, this is automatic layout constraint generation, but if designers also say, hey, you know, I, I, I can manually generate some layouts for you. Sure, go ahead and write it in a format that can be recognized by our magical tool. Then, you know, during our placement and the routing engine, which is very tedious in general, right? We were actually uh, try to uh, honor those symmetric, uh, such as the uh, uh, you know, symmetry and the mirror and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, when you place uh, those transistors and also when you route uh, the signals, right? Uh, so the output is a GDS2 layout, which is ready to be fabricated in whatever a fab, right? And uh, it is also DRC and LVS clean. Right? That's our goal. So you may say, wow, this sounds like uh, amazing. Is it uh, really possible? And, uh, and uh, 
the answer is uh, sure. Uh, actually, uh, we even actually have uh, used the magical to tap out a uh, pretty high performance uh, ADC chip. It's a uh, one giga sampling, uh, sampling per second and uh, Delta Sigma uh, ADC and has a state of the art performance. And we tap out using TSMC 40 nanometer technology. And it has uh, you know, several uh, sub blocks as you can see, right? Uh, integrators and uh, FR uh, feedback decks and the comparators and digital logics. Here's the, uh, the, 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 the ADC core and then uh, have a packaging, right? So uh, we actually uh, uh, even have a paper published at the uh, CICC, right? Uh, last year. And uh, as you can see, this is a manual tap out. This is our uh, magical tap out, which is automatically generated. So you can compare the performance here versus the manual layout. Actually, they are very, very comparable, right? as you can see in terms of the area, you know, and in terms of the uh, power, right? So actually our, our number is actually even slightly better. And uh, then the, like SFDR, SNDR, they are kind of comparable. You know, in some cases we are a little bit better, in some cases, you know, the manual is a little bit better, but uh, figure of merit are is better. Right? So, however, if you are doing, uh, you know, full manually, it takes the experience, the PhD students like a month or something, right? to do full layout and simulation and uh, iteration and so on and so forth, right? But using magical, it takes a minute, all right? So, wow, I think uh, with that, uh, I want to let you know, tell you that we have already open sourced the magical. And uh, uh, of course we cannot open source TSMC 40 nanometer technology. But uh, as you said, you guys are already, you know, thinking about Skywater, right? So Skywater has partnered uh, with uh, uh, Google uh, which were actually, uh, if you guys provide a design and which is clean and uh, approved by uh, Skywater and Google, they will tap out for you for free, right? So a uh, magical, um, uh, originally we, we support TSMC 40, we also tried the TSMC 65, but uh, now we are also migrating it to Skywater uh, 130 to support Sky Skywater 130. We are almost there, so uh, stay tuned. So I think when you are doing your, you know, tap out, right, for Skywater, right, maybe some of the, I mean, I'm not saying that you were just, you know, push a button, right, so at least, right, this provides very useful tools uh, for you to, you know, not worry about the very tedious place and route things, and, or at least you can use that as a good starting point if you still want to mess around, right, so I guess uh, that's all from, from my side. Okay, any questions, or we'll have questions for the end. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. No, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Say questions till we have one more presenter. Uh, Odanaka. Uh, Dr. Pan, you may not be muted yet. Uh, but thank you so much for your presentation. That was great. I'm very oh, interested. Okay. In we have one more presenter, right? Yes, yes, one more presenter. Can you see that you have the presenter here? Uh, yes. So if I click this. Be able to see the view here. Then let me make sure it's recording the screen. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ajinapa. Um, I'm with the Power Electronics and Power Systems Track. And I'm sure this presentation, hopefully I'm able to get you all not just interested, but also um, empower you guys to want to pursue research um, as part of something you're considering for your careers. And almost the most of the crowd I have here is undergrad. So hopefully you're able to uh, get good insights from this presentation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, um, in the power electronics and power systems track, but I'll mainly be focusing on power electronics. And what does power electronics entail? 
So this is the application of electronics to control and convert electric power. And when we're looking at these electronic systems, we're looking at different power devices that we integrate together, whether your transistors, your inductors, capacitors that we, we integrate together for various power applications, whether for small scale devices, such as your headsets, mobile phones, up to like large scale systems where we have like microgrids. So now we're thinking about generation, transmission, distribution, energy storage. But this is what the whole business of power electronics is. Um, and as the world is growing, we're continuously seeing like this nest of technological advancement um, in this power electronics business. And then the next question that comes up to um, how do you contribute to this ever growing need um, within the power electronic business in different technological advancements or like how do you know where to fit? So I know right now you guys are taking classes, most likely doing food projects and you're continuously getting this knowledge, getting these skills. But then the next question is how do you acquire the needed skills that you need um, when you're going into the workforce? Um, when you're applying for companies. And hopefully I want you guys to know that it's not just through summer internships that you can get that knowledge that you need, but also through research um, while you're here as an undergrad student. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna highlight three of the researches that I'm currently doing, or rather my team is currently doing in our research group. And hopefully through this research, um, projects that you do see, so I'm able to highlight how research can bring academia, what you're learning um, on campus in your undergrad classes into the industry. And a quick note is that I'm not going to go into extensive details about each of these research, but they're more of a highlight of um, the point that I'm trying to make here with undergrad research. So the first research that we're doing it here is the differential power processing for solar vehicles. Now, first of this research is sponsored by BMW, right? So BMW has a need for what they want to do with their cars and they're bringing it to us as researchers to help um, with their project. Now, of course, with solar vehicles, we're looking at electrification and electrification has been a growing need. Why? Because we're looking at global warming, we're looking at um, reducing our carbon footprints uh, with BMW, um, they want to create the solar vehicles that can help with that impact that we're looking for globally. Now, with solar um, panels or solar cells, it's really difficult to track the maximum power um, within these cells, especially for varying, varying insulation conditions, right? And with traveling vehicles, this becomes an issue. Why? Because you have the solar um, panels that are no longer stable, but they're moving along with the vehicles. Now this differential power processing um, allows us to create small and cheap, co cheap converters that can help with this maximum power point um, tracking systems and allows for the majority of power processing um, for the main onboard charger. But the point here that I want to highlight is with this project, for instance, it being sponsored by BMW, um, and um, a well-known industry um, within the vehicle industry, you get to have experience um, while researching on this project. You get to have experience um, um, scaling from controls all the way to like PCB designing, schematic layouts, um, different skills and design experiences that you do get as you're working on this project. So if you're an undergrad, for instance, and you do want to participate in this research, it's gonna be key for you because you're not only stepping, getting one foot into the um, industry, that's like working with BMW, but you're also getting a resume um, booster with the different skills that you do gain from working on these projects. Another project that I want to highlight, um, this is a project sponsored by NASA. So NASA has really been going into um, um, powering outer space, so like the moon, Mars, and hopefully they limit that to those planets. But um, the objectives of this project is to develop a power conversion system stable for future lunar and Mars habitats. So the primary obstacle with um, creating such power conversion systems for outer space is radiation 
and also scalability because we're dealing with high power, high voltage systems, and we want them to be scaled down to low weight, low size to be able to move them up to outer space. Now, with this project, um, we develop modular power conversion architectures that allows us to like um, scale down those high voltage, high power systems to be um, able to move them easily to outer space, but also to compact that issue of radiation that you do see um, when you start thinking of space, Mars, um, the moon and stuff like that. In this project, as an undergrad student, what you can learn from here is modeling, the skills that you can develop modeling, simulation, controls, again, PCB design. Um, over here, we use microcontrollers. So you're learning, you're applying um, your knowledge and C programming, learning about these different applications that you can use to help design such a system that will be beneficial in the power electronics industry. And in this case here, NASA. Um, so this is another research project to highlight this benefit that you do get as a researcher and see and seeing how it can gear you not just in the academic world, but also as you're looking to work into the industry for various companies. Um, the last research project that I'll be highlighting, this um, actually I'm working on it, and this is high frequency magnetics for solar micro inverters. Now the company that sponsors this is Enphase, and Enphase is really known for um, creating home energy solutions, so mainly related to um, solar panels, solar cells. And what they're trying to do with this project is for some of their new technologies, solar microinverters, um, they're trying to create microinverters for each solar panel to allow for their systems to operate independently um, while producing constant power as well as maximum power. Now, with these micro inverters, they're gonna be operating at high frequency. So we're looking at three to 30 megahertz frequency range and they require magnetics. But the issue with magnetics is when they're operating in, at high frequencies, we're gonna encounter different losses. Now, what I do here for this project, what my team and I do for this project is we design and develop different techniques that can help us optimize our design, our transformer designs um, to ensure that we're having lower losses, we're uh, um, operating with small scale devices that we can use in their micro inverters. And these are examples of some of the solutions that we do um, bring about. We um, theorize it, simulate it to make sure that our proof, to get our proof of concept, and then we experiment on it. We design the models that we need and then test it out to make sure that they're achieving the goals that we want. Um, in the project that I'm doing here right now, I even introduced a novel idea where we use flexible PCBs for our transformer windings. So typically you use copper wires, you use four windings, but now we're using flexible PCBs as one way to help with achieving the technique um, that I am proposing for this project. So anyway, needless to say, um, with this research, not only are you working with an industry, but you're also building the skills that you need um, that you know will be relevant for whatever industry that you want to work with, whether it's with TI, NASA, Enphase, Microsoft, and so on. So the next question is, what do you want to do, right? Um, like I mentioned earlier, many people wait to so they get a summer internship to like get that knowledge or the design skills that they want, or they only limit it to design projects that you want to learn in classes. But I want to encourage you all and urge you all, especially as undergrads, to seek um, research experience, right? Because the whole point here is um, by the time you do want to get a job, you want to have a concrete screen on your resume to help you um, be more attractive within the job market. And doing undergraduate research will help you with that. Why? Because you're gaining the intellect as well as the skills that you do need to work within those industries. And you do know you're getting those skills because the projects that you're working on are sponsored by companies that do require that experience that you are getting as an undergraduate. Um, before I move on, um, my group that I work with is Power Electronics and Magnetics Group. 
as highlighted on the top right. And I also work with the Center for Electronic for Electromechanics, which um, looks at power systems and microgrids. So hopefully throughout this presentation, I've encouraged you all and um, um, helped you shed some light on exactly how impactful research is for you as an undergrad in getting the skills that you do need um, as you go into the job market. And this concludes my presentation and I'll leave the floor open for questions. Uh, with the presenters that's gone so far, come back up. Uh, we'll take questions right now. All right, I guess if I need to just wait till the end. That's okay. Yeah, Ignore me on your uh, but... new circuits. Why <laughs> were the contacts attached by uh, the Kirby traces? Why do you use the so, traces? Yeah, the certain genes. Yeah. Uh, we use them for stretchability. So uh -huh. certain genes, when you pattern them on flexible or even with like proper yeah. traces, they let the 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 whole thing stretch. Which right. would not get one that that so you could pump on three because of stretchability. That makes sense. So on a chest, when you like stretch a bit, it stretches. I mean, we test it out to twenty percent. Wow. Wow. Cool. So that's why I use those. So we use island design and certain teams to have like more density and like industrial fabrication processes, but then the certain teams can allow you to trade. Makes sense. Thanks. Okay, we will now open up the floor for questions from the audience. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wait, have you checked? Well, we no, well, I mean you, you you can. It just you have to heat it for some time, right? Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen there's a YouTube video of a guy who punches like a steak or something and he, and he slaps it <laughs> enough times that it heats the steak and it's edible and it Wait, fully yeah, cooks it. Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to heat it for enough time. So yeah, you could cook meat with it. But the idea the, the goal is to you make it a really small area that you're heating. And so you would have to do it a lot, you know. It would be more efficient to just put it in an oven. Yeah, or like this. Good question. Uh, Dr. Pan, are you still on? Yeah. Perhaps. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what inspired you to make uh, magic for the Skywater process? Yeah. Pardon me? Uh, what made you want to make the magic for the Skywater process? Oh, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, magic is uh, supported by DARPA, and uh, they would also like to see us uh, supporting this uh, open source uh, PDK, right? Then more people can use it, right? So I'm, um, you know, that's a, are you saying the motivation? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the motivation, right? More people can use our magical, right? And uh, we can further develop it, right? Very cool. I hope I get a chance to. Yeah, yeah. I think it uh, what kind of circuits you guys are thinking about designing and putting on the shuttle? I mean, there are. Uh -huh. ADCs? Some ADC. Oh, OK. You should invite Professor Yao Yao Jia here. She is doing ADC. Would be good. Definitely going to talk about it more. Thank you. Yeah. Just over, but it's not awkward. Hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, our uh, tap out, uh, we, you know, we basically, yeah, uh, magical certainly can work on certain uh, uh, ADCs, right? Uh, one thing uh, is that uh, you know Skywater, uh, you know, especially it depends on what kind of ADC is, right? Uh, my students are migrating it to their uh, technology, right? Because they don't have so many metal layers; it's one thirty, right? So, so it's I think five or six metal layers, and uh, you know, if you need to do resistor and uh, uh, capacitor, so when you're trying to make those uh, caps, right? So uh, we found that you may need a metal three or metal four, right? So then there are not too many metal layers for routing, right? So 
but anyway, so, so, so it's not like as uh, uh, that uh, powerful as, uh, you know, it's an order PDK, right? But depending on what kind of chips you guys want to design, right? So yeah, that would be cool. Very cool. When is the timeline? Uh, proposals are May 1st. And so we'll, we'll help students figure out what circuits we're going to make uh, by our next meeting next week this time. And then we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. What? Well, sounds great. Take thought is November. Yeah. What? Well, sounds great. Actually, I have to leave soon. So uh, is there any more questions? We've got another question in the audience, but it's uh, it's for me. All right. Bye, Dr. Ben. Yeah, okay, bye. Just let me know. And I think if you need any help for ADC, right? I think my group still have some uh, senior PhD student. Uh, you know, uh, I co-advise with Professor Nansu uh, working on ADC. He's defending next, um, next week or something, but he will still be around for a little while. And Professor Yao Yao Jia definitely is an expert in ADC, right? So it depends on what kind of ADC is, right? You might get some input from her. And also, we were also talking about some collaborations, right? So because a lot of the, this layout, you know, if it's very tedious, you know, I mean, you guys can do other more, in, you know, in intellectually interesting part, right? Then get, you know, magical to do this uh, layout for you, right? So meanwhile, you know, you can do other simulations and topology size. By, by the way, my group also works on sizing, right? So uh, transistor sizing, et cetera. So um, automatically, uh, automation. So uh, yeah, anyway, um, good luck for your uh, proposal and, uh, and so on, right? Okay, bye. Thanks bye. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, bye. So we have to build uh, interference sensor like that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a problem. So I, I haven't done any microwave work yet, but uh, the, some of the some of the projects that use microwave antennas, um, they'll put a backing on the on the back to to make it more directional, um, and, or they'll make they'll put shields around the around the outside of it, like a kind of like a little housing for it, and uh, that helps to minimize the interference as well. But it's definitely a problem. Uh, I have to do you have to do a lot of waterproofing for your circuit because it's only going to skin? Like, are, are you like able to just shower with it? Like, is that ever an issue with testing it? Yeah, good question. So. Um, I don't know my slides up, but I had some supplementary slides where uh, we show that we're actually pouring water on the tattoo and it's still fine. So we actually, um, depends on what kind of tattoo we're talking about. The, the chest tattoo is, doesn't, the electronics doesn't actually contact the body because it's separated by the medical film dressing that you saw. And it's actually bounded on both sides by the medical film. So it's actually watertight, sealed, right? And the battery is recharged too, so you can just recharge it uh, wirelessly. Um, so that is waterproof. But then on the neck tattoo, the neck tattoo, the LEDs actually contact the skin to get more uh, higher SNR yield. So that is actually exposed to sweat from the skin. And we actually had one uh, one time where one of the LEDs uh, shorted because of the sweat. So there is that problem there. But again, like that's a packaging issue. You can actually make it it's also waterproof. So we're working on that. But yeah, good question. Oh yeah, I also have a question for you. How long like does the user like wear the patch? Uh, that that's what I was going to talk about, but I. Missed it out on because I was short of time. So, ideally, you can wear it for as long as you want to. Uh, you can just so on the chest tattoo, you can actually replace the battery with easily. It's one the battery, you can stick it up and point it so you can go, go, go. But your skin actually regenerates uh, every one to two weeks. So, these things are kind of like band aids. Like, if you, if you wear a band aid for too long and you take it off, you see that your skin is kind of like a little bit crumpled, rumpled. That's because basically your dead skin is coming out, but they can't like get washed away because the battery is not there. So the tattoos uh, ideally can last one week and then you have to replace them because you know the dead skin goes beneath it. And so you'll also lose like if you're doing like electrical measuring like ECG or EMG or EEG, you'd actually lose your signal because dead skin basically kind of like insulates the electrical signals from your circuits. So you would have to replace it every week, I guess. I do have a question about that. So like since this is not just like a regular band, like this is we're looking at chips on this item right so it means that there's going to be a cost that does come in when you're replacing it so have you guys found a way to help eliminate that those that skin those that skin so that you're able to reuse um the 
So, uh, so, so our design again. I, I wish I had more slides to show you guys. Our design is actually modular, so you can take off the electronics mm -hmm. and dispose the medical tape that contacts the body, but you can use electronics in another other medical tape. So electronics actually can be used. Okay. So when you have to replace them, you just take them off, uh, and it's not as simple as I make it sound because because of all the material considerations. But you can actually remove the electrode layer, throw it away, put a new electrode layer, and put it back on the skin. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the electronics does get reused. Okay. I have a question for Priyan Tanaka. Uh, does Dr. Hansen and Dr. Longsford do any collaboration? Um, right now, we don't have any direct collaborations with them um, because of the sort of projects that we do, but those collaborations do exist. So, for instance, uh, right now, I know Professor Wang works with the Center of Electromechanics, so the CEM. And I also do a project with them in conjunction with Professor Hansen. So right now, there's no direct link between Professor mm -hmm. Hansen and Professor Wang, but there's always collaborations within the group, whether with industry or like the other research facilities. Very cool. Why do you have a project for them to work on together? Always. All right, well, let's give it a hand for all our presenters. Uh, uh, from Dr. Shankar Group, we have Theo. Uh, oh, we're going to flash it, of course. Yes, I know. If you'd be so kind, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, here, make sure that's sharing, that will be all yours. Oh, it's gone. Right. So I'm Theo Shaw. I'm in Dr. Shanker's quantum circuits group. We're up at Pickle Research Campus by the domain. Um, sorry, I got here late. I missed a lot of presentations. The one I saw, ones I saw were very interesting. So I'm here to talk a bit about uh, the work we're doing and why we need analog circuitry to do that work. So uh, introductory slide. Since we're the quantum circuits group, really, that's referring to uh, superconducting quantum circuits that are used primarily for quantum computing. So there's a question of what is a qubit. It's the fundamental element of a quantum computer. Um, the obvious comparison is to a classical bit, which is always exactly in the zero or one state. Uh, quantum bit or qubit can be in the zero or one state, but can also it can also be in a superposition of the two states, which is denoted by that um, letter psi in the brackets there. Uh, that state that the qubit is in is alpha sum coefficient complex coefficient times the zero state plus beta some complex coefficient times the one state. And essentially alpha and beta are denoting the likelihood that the qubit is in one of those two states if you were to take a measurement of it. Um, those two states can be represented by this block sphere where there's a vector pointing to uh, the radius one sphere, which is psi. And then uh, zero and one are the two extremes and the complex phase between the two states represents the, uh, the angle phi on the, um, on the sphere. So in order to make a qubit, you start off by realizing that um, a harmonic oscillator has a lot of the properties that you want. So think of the typical spring mass system as your starting example. Um, as you change the position of the block X from its equilibrium position, you'll be increasing the, the potential energy and decreasing the kinetic energy. And the block will oscillate back and forth along X. Well, if you want the electrical equivalent of that, you can do that by making a parallel LC circuit. And there, the energy will be oscillating between current flowing through the inductor and charge building up on the capacitor. And again, it will show the same sinusoidal behavior. 
Now, if you want to take the quantum version of that, which essentially is making the inductor and capacitor very small, so the total energy involved becomes correspondingly small, what you wind up finding is that the energy is restricted instead of being anywhere on this curve to taking certain discrete values, which you can denote as the zero, one, two, et cetera states. And that's pretty helpful, but since we're trying to make a quantum computer, we really are only interested in two particular states. We don't want to be going off into other states because then it gets harder and harder to do the computation. So we want to be ideally just in the zero and one state. And the way that you can do that is by introducing some nonlinearity to the circuit so that you replace the inductor with what's called the Joseph's injunction, which essentially is a nonlinear inductor where the inductance changes depending on how much current is flowing through it. And what that does is it uh, moves those those energy states that you're restricted to so that you don't have equal spacing between them anymore. Now you have a different energy gap between the zero and one state as you do between the one and two state and so on and so forth. So if you're always applying photons at that omega zero one uh, frequency, then you can stay solely within the zero and one states unless something really bad and unexpected happens and then you wind up in some other state that you don't want, but we'll ignore that. So, this, um, this qubit, which is the parallel Joseph's injunction and capacitor, which is a quantum harmonic oscillator, uh, you need some way of interacting with it, which is to say, doing operations on it and reading the state of the qubit. And the way that you do that is by connecting it by some transmission line to um, a signal generator, which can produce arbitrary signals at a frequency um, or arbitrary signals around some frequency, which is the omega zero one frequency. In the case of the, um, of the circuits that are state-of-the-art these days, it's typically somewhere in the microwave. So something like five gigahertz is typical for a qubit. Um, there's potential for that to increase in the future as better analog electronics are made. Um, telecoms are making faster and faster electronics. So we could potentially get to higher frequencies without um, spending unnecessarily high amounts of money on equipment, but something for the future. For now, we're in the we're roughly five gigahertz range. So in order to change the state of the qubit, which is moving that psi vector on the block sphere, you're applying some arbitrary signal, which could be something like that example shown there. Um, the sine wave shown in the blue is a five gigahertz tone. And then that's multiplied by some envelope, which is the, the orange lines. So hypothetically, you want to apply some signal like that to do some operation on the qubit. And eventually, you'll also want to read the signal that's reflected by the qubit in order to learn what state the qubit is in. That's difficult to do because, um, as we said, that's a five gigahertz signal. So if you want to do some sort of arbitrary uh, waveform, in theory, the obvious way to do it is with a DAC. But getting a DAC that can do good precision at five gigahertz would be extremely expensive. So what's the alternative? The alternative is something called a frequency mixer. As we said, the signal that we're trying to apply is a signal at five gigahertz times an envelope, which is lower frequency. Um, if you actually take the FFT of that, what you wind up finding is that you get signals at plus five and minus five gigahertz, but you also have some more signals from the envelope that are kind of uh, smeared around that five gigahertz signal. That's due to the multiplication. And the ideal mixer is a component that essentially just multiplies two input signals. And if you multiply two cosines, for example, as shown here, what you wind up finding is that the output signal is a cosine at um, you get two cosines at the sum and the different, so yeah, the sum and the difference of the frequencies, which is the behavior that you want to see from the FFT. So if you have some high frequency signal at five gigahertz and you have a low frequency signal, uh, which is at the, at the frequency of the carrier, what you'll get when you take the, um, the product of the two is this FFT, which has the behavior that we want. Uh, one way that a mixer can be implemented, if you're curious, is with a diode, essentially any nonlinear element. Um, if you sum the two inputs, what you wind up finding is a, a multiplicative result on the output. So diodes work, you can make much more complicated circuits than that, but a diode is a good example. So we're using these mixers then to get away from the uh, five gigahertz stacks and ADCs. And the way that we do that is with a five gigahertz sine wave generator, which is denoted as the microwave generator here. Then you multiply, uh, you feed that into an amplifier, which is also not a particularly expensive component. And then feed that into an IQ mixer or just some general mixer. And the mixer also has inputs coming from a lower frequency DAC, which is now much more affordable than a five gigahertz DAC. 
there's more amplification. There's a filter to filter out the high frequency component, which you don't want. And then there's a switch to um, turn this, this system on and off so that you aren't introducing unwanted signals to the qubit when you aren't trying to put on signal. Um, and then there's a similar thing in reverse to read the output of the qubit to determine its state. And rather than uh, trying to do all this on a PCB, what we found is that it's cheaper and easier to buy modules that have one of these blocks each and string them together. So there are various vendors who will sell these modules and then it's up to you to um, combine the different pieces. And so the control chain module is shown on that sort of optical table there. Uh, I should have included some scale, but the entire metal plate is roughly five inches by five inches for what it's worth. So take electronics like this, you run transmission lines from the output into a dilution refrigerator that's cooling the qubit down to something like 0 0.01 Kelvin. And then you can start doing um, interesting quantum computing stuff. So that's one example of where analog electronics comes into play in our research. Associated with this project, we also have two undergrads who are working on a temperature controller to maintain the temperature of the analog electronics because the mixers are very sensitive to changes in temperature. You'll wind up with a, a phase drift as the temperature drifts. There's also um, a project to generate the different power supplies for all these components. A lot of them have, um, as you can see in the orange boxes, very different power requirements. So rather than buying one power supply for each of these components, we take one big power supply, a switching 12 volt power supply, and on a PCB, use one of your regulators to generate the other voltages that we need. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Um, we're trying to constrain the temperature swings to within 0.01 Kelvin. That's, yeah, it's a little bit confusing because I also mentioned 0.01 Kelvin in the fridge, but um, the electronics will be at room temperature, the microwave electronics. Yep. Um, so far, we're still a relatively new group. Our PI just got here about two years ago, so we haven't actually taken coherence measurements of any qubits yet. We're still trying to we're in the fab, get the fridge set up. Um, state of the art right now for superconducting qubits and 3D cavities, which um, are, I think, the most promising, is, as I recall, something from tens to hundreds of micro microseconds. With a superconducting qubit? Oh, that's interesting. OK, yeah. I'll have to check that out. Uh, yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned. So the applications of quantum computers generally, um, they haven't been used for any particularly useful calculations, but they promise to uh, offer speed ups over classical computers for problems where you have a lot of degrees of freedom. So things like um, modeling drugs and figuring out what they'll do in your body, uh, encryption, breaking encryption, um, things like that. There's interest in quantum computers. So you're mentioning that you might temperature of the mixer itself, which sits outside of the chamber yeah. in a certain degree. Mm -hmm. uh, you also know like, what type of frequency signal you need. That's, you're trying to get a frequency signal. Yeah. So when you have frequency instabilities, what winds up happening is you decohere the qubit from the state that you expect it to be, mm -hmm. which is one of the ways that your quantum state drifts away from what you want and you start introducing errors in the calculation. So uh, there's not really. A good answer, I would say, it's just as stable as possible. Okay, appreciate you coming out. Yep, no problem. Yeah, you're Sorry. Yeah. All righty. So, if there's anyone who's interested in the Pigo competition, uh. Trinavas is here to talk more about it. But I think that's the end of our meeting. Thank if you, you have any questions. <laughs>